Oh, okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming coming uh, today. It's a pleasure to have uh, among us Professor George Cornis from uh, the RPI. Uh, Professor Cornis uh, got his uh, MS in Physics at Utrecht University in Budapest in 1993, and his PhD from Virginia Tech in 1997. His uh, background is in statistical physics and interacting in agent-based systems. Uh, he was also uh, a postdoc at the Supercomputer Computation Research Institute at FSU between 97 and 2000, and he's been at RPI in the physics department since 2000. He's currently an associate professor there, and his uh, research is on dynamics, uh, op opinion dynamics and influencing social networks, transport and flow in complex network, and synchronization in coupled stochastic systems. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak for, for, uh, for those who came. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry about the, it may be too dim, so actually the quality is really going to be much better on these or probably on those monitors. But, but uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the, the impact of time delays in, uh, in coupled, coupled system. Again, it has many applications ranging from consensus problems, synchronization, coordination, um, and sort of that's sort of the ultimate goal to see what happens when we combine all those effects, uh, interacting agents on a particular network with some time delay, which naturally emerges in any kind of communication system, and probably stochastic effects. But before getting there, uh, I decided that I'm going to go through a few, a few examples, perhaps not the first ones, but the ones that I could find, which go back and, and give some examples how, how the, the question of delays historically came up. Among the uh, among the first uh, among the first times, so uh, the very first one was uh, motivated by by the need to explain, uh, uh, for example, financial cycles, macroscopic cycles in the economy, you know, ups and downs, which periodically repeat it's repeat themselves. And although the particular way to to get to this equation is is it's more complicated, but uh, this guy Kaletsky, a long time ago, 1935. He came up with a way to, to sort of uh, get down to some equation which, which captures, for example, the time evolution on, of, of investment orders in a company. And uh, basically, there was a, a microscopic time scale included in, the, in that equation, which was referred to as the gestation pe period. Basically, the whole point in that is once you start to invest to whatever it is, it will take some time to turn some profit. So once you go through all these various equations, at the end, you boil down with some, which will carry the, uh, that ingredient, basically. No matter what you do now, you're not going to generate profit immediately, but it will take some time. So, so hence, that was the, the reason for time delay in this context. And, and the ultimate goal of this was to, to sort of understand and explain macroscopic time scales in the system. So this may be on the order of a year or so, but then what's going to be the, the bigger impact of, of that on the global scale? And, and what he found after analyzing the system of equations, and also basically these two guys were the ones who actually did solve that, is that the inclusion of a microscopic time scale can, can explain the emergence of a macroscopic time scale on the period of, uh, let's say, 10 years. And if one goes to the details of how to deal with this equation, indeed, you will see that if you have a lot of uh, solutions with, uh, with oscillatory modes, and uh, the period of the oscillatory mode, indeed, can give rise to 10 years, basically triggered by a, a small microscopic time scale. Perhaps this was the one, the first one where time delays explicitly entered uh, the construction of, of the time evolution equation of the system. And hence, I wanted to, to mention it. Another important model from, uh, from population dynamics, basically. It's the Hutchinson model, which is just the time-delayed version of the, uh, of the logistic equation. So this is the logistic equation, the logistic growth. Forget about the term in the bracket first in, in explaining what it is. Basically, it tells you what is the rate of change of the number of individuals in this population. And the first term, this r times n, is the one which tells you what is the growth rate. The more animals you have or creatures you have, the, the, fast, the, the bigger the growth rate will be. But growth cannot happen unimpeded, basically, because there is limited resources only. So there has to be something which will, which will curb the unlimited growth. That's the 1 minus n over k term. And indeed, basically, k is referred to as the, uh, the carrying capacity. So an equation of this sort. When you look at it, even without solving, although this can be solved, it's so simple, you can immediately see that it has two, two fixed points. 
when the population is zero, so that's sort of the, the, the extinct case, and when the population is exactly k, so then the second term will be zero. It turns out with minimal analysis that then the zero population is always unstable, so once you induce some small seed, then uh, governed by the carrying capacity, the system will, will reach uh, the steady state value, or the fixed point value k, and, and, that's, and that's the stable one. So the question then happens, what happens when, uh, when, when there's some time delay involved in this, uh, in this uh, limited, limiting term? The motivation for that can be, for example, where uh, certain larva species, when, uh, when uh, the, uh, uh, what matters is when the eggs are formed, the available resources at that time, not when the embryo comes out of the egg. In, in even more, more uh, rigorous way, perhaps one should have a time integral between t is equal to zero back to t minus tau. But and the, at, at the minimal case, the, t the presence of the time delay is important because resources are needed, not at the time when the individual came to life, but basically when, when, the, when the embryo was formed. So that was the motivation behind the logistic growth with delay named uh, after, after Hutchinson. And then the question emerges, and again, this one turns out to be always unstable, but the, the non-zero population fixed point. When there's a stable population and you impose some perturbation, what about the stability of, uh, of, the, of the fixed point? So again, this is unstable, this is stable, you do the usual linearization, and that's the equation what you find. So again, just linearizing this, this is the equation that you end up with. This is the simplest uh, linear equation with delays and you know just like when you see a linear equation of this sort and no delay you know the solution immediately basically as long as the the prefactor you know is minus some positive numbers basically you're going to have exponential relaxation to, to zero so it, it would be stable if you have no time delays when you have uh, dx dt minus rx the solution is uh, some e to the e to the minus rt so we know that's the exponential solution basically just uh, steady relaxation so when there is tau is zero, the, the fixed point is always stable. So the question is, what happens when, when there is delay? So when you have to deal with this equation, and as it turns out, it can be solved uh, analytically, was done by these guys, later by others, many others independently. There is a very clear threshold, and uh, given a particular growth rate, um, the product of, of the growth rate and the time delay has to be less than a number. This model is simple enough that that number is known, but in, in, in a lot of more complicated model, one can show that oftentimes you end up with a threshold so that, let's say, the, the growth rate uh, or the coupling constants, time delay, has to, has to be less than an order of one number. So that's the message that, that if you keep, for any fixed growth rate, if you keep increasing the time delay, sooner or later you leave the region of stability. Or the other way around, if the time delay is fixed and non-zero, but you keep increasing the coupling, then again you're going to break the stability threshold. And what you would see under those circumstances, as long as the, as the threshold is, uh, uh, is under the limit, so basically as long as the time delay and the growth rate is under the, the threshold limit, you're going to have relaxation to, to the stable fixed point. So the fixed point is stable, but if you, you exceed the threshold, then there is a bifurcation and the periodic limit cycle will emerge. So this is perhaps the simplest uh, set of uh, equation to show the, the fundamental impact of time delays, how the stability of fixed point changes suddenly when the time delay and or the coupling exceeds some, some threshold. I want to bring just another example to show where time delay equations uh, are commonly used. One was regarding various balancing ac actions, either humans or basically humans balancing a rod. Uh, maybe just uh, say a few words about this example, basically describing the, the postural sway, basically fluctuations in the center of pressure. People can monitor it and you would see some you know, random motion. And uh, there has been many attempts to describe this kind of uh, randomness in postural sway using stochastic differential equations. There has to be some feedback, linear or nonlinear, and some stochastic effects. Uh, this would be perhaps the first idea that one could, could use that uh, sort of the, the restoring motion has this relaxation feature. So if, the, if you deviate too much from the equilibrium <coughs> position, there is this, this the restoring effect, but there is a time delay because we are human, okay? Things have to propagate and act and your cognitive uh, <coughs> limits and also the actions that you take to correct, so basically how you keep your balance, plus some stochas stochastic effects. It turns out the situation is much more complicated than this. Typically, it turns out there is a positive feedback, but there is a switch like this continuous uh, reversion once you reach some threshold. But in general, in these type of balancing uh, uh, scenarios, it is very common to, to have uh, feedback equations with linear or nonlinear features and time delays and stochastic effects. Um, what I'm going to talk about 
at, at, at least at, uh, at addressing the most fundamental questions is when you have interacting individuals. Again, the equation so far and uh, the balancing thing is, was relating to, 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 uh, to basically some mean field, uh, in a mean field setting, density of individuals or, or the, the postural scale of one single variable. So we explicitly go into address coupled individuals, agents or humans or whatever entities the network consists of and see that when you have some tendency to consensus or, or uh, coordination, and normally that might be reached by the system, what happens when, when time delays uh, are emerging, and what is the impact of time delays in reaching consensus, coordination, or synchronization? Uh, a few common examples where, where this can be, a, uh, where this can be a, an appropriate scenario, flocking birds. They are basically individual birds only look around in a neighborhood maybe in a limited uh, range, or perhaps the, the, the closest five neighbors, and they try to adjust their heading and their speed based on what they see just around them. Okay, so it's a dynamically changing network, but there is some network effect, obviously. And uh, so they make the gradual adjustment in their heading and speed based on what they see around them. So in, in the simplest model, you may, you may write down that uh, each bird is going to change the velocity so that to make it the average. In the, in the region. That may, may transform to the Laplacian, basically. When you perform local average in space or any network, that, that becomes equivalent to the Laplacian operation. You know. uh, a different setting, uh, <coughs> uh, neurons firing in the brain, you do know that they, th there is some underlying uh, synchronization phenomena there. There is finite time for the electric signals to, to spread, so, so the impact on time delay can also be important. Load balancing uh, problem, it, it doesn't look too well here, but you can see it on the, on the screen. These little <coughs> blinking spots are indicating uh, the loads in, in various locations on the Earth. Obviously, if you want to balance your load, you, you gather the information where resources available elsewhere. By the time you get that information, they, they have been changed. So the time delay is also important in, in, um, in balancing uh, situations. Okay. I don't want to talk too much about it. I went through that already. This was the guy, I guess, who, who, who first came up with some very nice and simple model to, desca to describe flocking birds. Uh, essentially, some averaging procedure, adjusting uh, <coughs> the separation, <coughs> excuse me, alignment or cohesion for these birds, all local operations. Their, their motivation was to come up with a very simple algorithm so that you can animate flocking birds. And, and the reason behind that, that they wanted to to have doing this kind of animation for motion pictures, Lion King or whatever it is. So you don't want to start uh, drawing these birds flying uh, using some, some ad hoc fashion. You want to write an algorithm that will nicely create flocking birds or school of fish. So that was their motivation without much, much uh, drive to understand the fundamental features. Vichek and company, they, they wrote a very nice paper in 1995 and they used the simplest model of this sort. The only thing that they changed in that, in that flocking bird story is that they uh, they had uh, birds with uh, fixed velocity vectors which can change their direction and uh, every bird is going to adjust uh, their direction based on the local average that they can see. That happens to be the weighted Laplacian plus they added some stochastic uh, effects and, and, and that, that model was sufficient enough to, to, to show regions of cohesive and coherent motion. So that uh, depending on the noise and the coupling basically, maybe how, how frequently birds are checking the, the uh, the, the direction of the neighbors, basically, you could see flocking motion or random motion. And, and not so long ago, they, these guys in, in Rome, Cavani and company, they, they, they started to take uh, digitized snapshots of birds, and, and they were identifying indeed the, oops, the, uh, the deep correlations in, in flocking motions. So indeed, uh, it happened to be that these, uh, these flocking motions have that particular property that, that critically emerges. So, so there are long-range correlations as a result of the interactions. And apparently, when the, when the correlation is long-range, it has beneficial effects. So the system can respond very efficiently if a predator basically enters, uh, enters the, uh, the flock at some point. The whole flock can respond almost uh, instantaneously and, and basically move away in that fashion. So that's, that's one important feature about being critical. OK, another example. And, uh, maybe this is very common, uh, describing uh, vehicular flow. Naturally, there, there are delays because individuals see what's happening ahead of them, and it may take some time to actually see what happens, but then it takes some time to actually react. So reaction times, again, cognitive delays. And uh, for some reason, I have to start it by hand. 
and uh, and uh, some people had too much time, I guess, on their hands, so they decided to 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 implement it in, in, in reality. This is periodic boundary conditions in action. You know, this is when you see physics, we talk about periodic boundary conditions, but even we don't believe that it, it ever happens. So this is how you do periodic boundary conditions ring. So so they had these drivers sort of go, going around and uh, and. Uh, Basically, you can see that spontaneously these shocks will form, form and which will propagate backwards. And uh, it was nice to see that even though there is no particular reason why, uh, why these cars should, should ever stop, uh, nevertheless, they do come to these situations when there is an extreme slowdown and then, of course, the, the, the piling up will, will start and it will propagate backwards. Again, a, a simple sort of equation can be of, uh, of something like this. When the rate of change of, of an individual car will depend on what is the difference in the velocity just ahead of you and yourself. If the car is ahead of you going way faster, then you, you, you can accelerate because it's safe. And if the car is ahead of you basically is going slower, then, you, then you're going to decelerate. And again, this is just at the linear level, no, stoch no stochastic effects. But even this can explain sort of the periodic nature, both in space and time, of the, of the, of the shocks which form in a system like that. So you can see in, in these examples that, that uh, the delays are essentially emerging very naturally in all these systems when decisions are to be made, whether it is to balance uh, resources or coordinate movements or synchronize uh, in, in various systems. So what I'm going to talk about, and sort of that's the, the, the topic of the talk, is to, to go through a very particular example where we keep all details as simple as possible, but uh, having everything that we need there. So the ingredients will be the uh, network topology. So we're going to look at uh, individuals which are coupled through particular networks. So the network effect will be important. We're going to have some time delays, and we're going to have stochastic effects. So imagine that you have one variable, whatever your interest is. In the case of flocking birds, it might be the, uh, the heading. So that's the relevant variable. In case of synchronization problems or power flows, it may be the voltage difference between uh, substations, which you have to minimize. Large differences are, are not beneficial. So we're just going to have an abstract problem when each node will have a local state variable. And the basic question we ask is that how close these individual variables are to one another as a function of the time delay or the coupling and the network effects and the noise. So there will be one quantity that I will sort of, that will be the basic observable at some point, and that is the typical spread. I, I may refer to that as the synchronization landscape. So imagine that you just simply draw the value of the state variable for each node. Okay, so it may be a, a, a huge fluctuation landscape. You may refer to that as a poorly coordinated attempt, okay, or, or poorly synchronized, because there's a huge spread of the value of the individual nodes. If somehow you manage to synchronize or coordinate better, you may end up with this. Okay, so this may be termed as a, as a better coordinated or better synchronized network, whatever the particular application is. So this, between this and this, this is the quantity which captures that. This is the spread or the width. If, if, if the width is large, then W2 is going to be a huge number. I may refer to it as the spread of the synchronization landscape or the width. And if you manage to tune your variables uh, in a better fashion, you may suppress large fluctuations and then W2 is going to be small. In a, in a very strict way, you may refer to the system as synchronizable or, or well-coordinated if, if it is finite in the infinite system size limit or in the infinite time. So if the system relaxes to a steady state, when the width has a finite value, you may refer to that as synchronizable. But even there, you can try to make it better by, by making it a smaller finite number. So let's see the particular set of equations. Again, some of them are, are, are even coming from those examples that we mentioned, but, but we keep them rather general. So this set of equation shows up in many contexts, I guess in computer science, system engineering, referred to as the consens consensus problem. Basically, n agents are coupled through some uh, network. It is captured by the adjacency matrix. Maybe there is a different coupling strength for each node that is captured by CIJ. Yes? This slide, uh, it's also assumed that n is tending to infinity, right? It can, yeah. So, so we, n can go to infinity, and it is possible that, that uh, in certain networks, in particular low dimension or regular topologies, this guy may, may, may reach a finite value for any finite n, but as n goes to infinity, it can diverge. It turns out that even without time delay, that can be the case. And uh, in low dimensions, that, there are examples for that. So. 1, 2D, you can have diverging widths even without time delay as a result of uh, the small eigenvalues of the Laplacian. But I would like that. So you also assume 
method to capture the divergence when n is finite? Like, well, then then it will be a divergence which will depend on, for example, the time delay. So I will get there to what kind of divergence will will show up there. So this is the the, the basic equation that we will extend in two ways. So again, this shows up in many contexts. You know, this kind of coupling it just tells you that this is the basic coordination movement. If if what, what does determine the rate of change of this variable at node i? Well, what will determine that is how different it is from its neighbors. Okay? So basically, you look at the difference between hi and hj, and basically, if hi is greater than hj, then you're going to reduce it, and if it is smaller, then you're going to increase it. So that's the basic Laplacian coupling. This operator, if you, you know, sort of work it out, this is just the Laplacian. So what we're going to do, basically, we're going to throw in time delays there. So, so the rate of change will not depend on the, the current value, but something which happened a little bit earlier, because perhaps you need finite time to, to, to make those corrective motions. So you want to make your, your variables and adjustments such that you mimic that of the neighbors, but it may be with some time lag. And ultimately, we're going to throw in some stochastic effects. This is just some uh, white noise, Gaussian noise. So you have synchronization moves but with some time delay, and you have these constant uh, random kicks, which are sort of to drive the system away from, from the uniform state. And these are the, the fundamental ingredients that we are going to consider. So these three, the network structure and the coupling, if it is a weighted network, time delays, and the noise. Now, as I said, just sort of uh, work it out, this is nothing but uh, the Laplacian. So this gamma is the uh, La Laplacian operator in this case. In the simplest case, which mostly I will focus on, you have the same time delay. You don't have to have the same time delay. It will become more complicated, but, but some of the fundamentals can be captured by that, so I will stick with it. So what do you do with this equation? Again, everything is known, basically, rate of change, time derivative, Laplacian coupling, and noise. How do you solve it? Basically, you, 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 you diagonalize. So basically, you go to the, pa the, the space where, where the Laplacian is, is diagonal. And then each mode is going to obey the same uh, evolution equation there. The only difference will be the effective coupling, which is just the eigenvalue of the Laplacian of that mode. So again, every mode of the Laplacian will be governed by the same equation. But whatever the eigenvalue of this Laplacian or weighted Laplacian will show up as the effective coupling. You, you may even recall that if you forget about the noise, this was the same equation which showed up in the, in the Hutchinson uh, logistic growth model, basically, when we looked at the stability of that uh, stable fixed point, it was precisely this thing which showed up. So that is essentially fully sufficient to understand the stability of this problem as well. So what is the, the just a few more most important thing about the Laplacian? Well, it has one eigenvalue. Just we focus on one network, which, which is one single connected component. If you have multiple islands, those two islands will have nothing to do with one another. So we just focus on one, one connected component. That will come with one zero eigenvalue as all Laplacian and then a non-zero one basically following those, and then there is a largest one. So it is good to keep track of the, uh, the, uh, the smallest kind of eigenvalues and the largest ones as well. It turns out in this case, time delays will be very sensitive to the largest eigenvalue, so I will get there in detail. Also, the, uh, that measure that I introduced, basically how good the synchronization or coordination is, that can also be translated into the, to the particular modes, namely it turns out to be the sum of the fluctuations of the individual, mo individual modes. Again, here is the stochastic differential equation. Uh, if you have no time delay, this is what you find in all stochastic books. It is called the ornstein ullenbeck process. Okay, basically, you, you can look it up, how it behaves. I will say a few words about that. So each mode is going to be governed by that. You can calculate what is the, the, the variance of this random quantity. And if you do that, you sum it up for all modes, then you get the spread. So that's how you go from, let's say, the, the widths based on all nodes, you can go into the modes of the Laplacian, and you can also express that in terms of those. OK, so as I said, once you do the, the diagonalization, really this is the, the only thing that you have to look at, a single stochastic differential equation with noise and delay. It turns out that this equation itself uh, turned out to have direct application to, to model, basically, TCP congestions. I'm not very familiar with that, but this equation precisely in this form showed up there where the congestion window, I guess, is the amount of data that can be sent without uh, acknowledging. So this was a model equation for that where it uh, explicitly comes up. And also these guys, for the terms of the single variable, Küchler and Mensch, Mensch they, they, they did some ve very thorough analysis on, of, the, of this equation a while ago. So I will, I will mention those as I move along. So what can, what can one know about an equation of this sort. Again, it's just a single equation, noise, delay, basically relaxation. What happens when you have no delay? 
well, before like, whether you have no delay or have delay, what would you, what would you do to, to understand this equation? Forget about the noise. Just look at the characteristic equation. You would look for exponential solution, okay? Basically, that will be sufficient to understand how the system responds, stability, etc. Then you can add the noise and basically solve it as an as a, uh, inhomogeneous equation. But basically, first forget about the noise. Naturally, when you see a linear differential equation with or without delay, you would look for a solution of this sort, right? An exponential kind. So you take it, you throw it in, and what you would find, just look at these two terms, is that you get a characteristic equation. Once you put in the exponential, you get a s in the derivative and basically minus lambda from the right, on the right-hand side. So this is the characteristic equation uh, that you find. Now, it is a, in this case, it is kind of complicated, but just to, to remember, when you have no time delays, then, of course, you, you have the trivial answer. It's just a basic exponential relaxation, right? When there is only one solution of this equation, if tau is zero, what you find is that this relaxation rate is equal to minus lambda. Th that's basically the simplest exponential. That's what you do, I guess, when you first start to solve differential equations, that you throw in these exponentials and you identify the, uh, the rate in the exponent. Again, and that's precisely what happens when the time delay is zero. Now, of course, what happens here is that now, when the time delay is non-zero, you have this full transcendental equation. And as such, it is not just different, but, but it is, uh, its complexity is, is enormously larger than the original characteristic equation. You, it's not just a second or third order or finite number of solutions, but you have infinitely many solutions. Okay? And basically, once you have infinitely many, many solutions, in order for, for relaxation to occur, namely that you have exponential decay to zero, then you have to consider all solutions, and all the real part of the solutions have to have a negative sign. Okay? Otherwise, you're going to have exponential divergence. So you have to find all solutions, and you have to look at the real part of all solutions. And if they are all negative, then you can say that uh, it's a coordinated state, or basically the fixed point is stable, or whatever, whatever your, your uh, objective is. So it turns out to be the case for the stochastic one as well, that you throw in the, the solutions of the characteristic equation, and then for this case, you can find what is the spread of the individual modes. And you can see explicitly, although you cannot evaluate this in a closed form, but you can see that this is a sum over all solutions. And uh, this will only become finite as opposed to infinity if the real part of any solution of the characteristic equation has a negative sign. Again, t goes to infinity. You want to see whether you reach steady state or not. The only case when you do reach steady state, if the coefficient here we have a negative real part. Then you have basically relaxation to that steady state. So that's the condition. That's basically the condition for synchronization or coordination, quite analogously to the very first example of the Hutchinson model, basically, where once the linearization is done, you have to just require that the real part is going to have a negative sign. And as such, for this characteristic equation, the condition for all real parts to be negative is this. So in this very simple model, it's a coupled system with noise and delay. The condition for for coordination and synchronization, namely that the width is finite, happens to be the same as for that very basic model by Hutchinson. Namely, uh, the effective coupling, which is just the eigenmode for, for that particular mode of the Laplacian times tau, has to be less than an order one number, pi over two in this case, because it was very simple. But in, in, in other cases, you have, sometimes you have similarly captivatingly simple, simple uh, uh, threshold conditions. OK, so basically, now we understand that at least the big picture about the individual modes. I just want to see some individual time series. So this is what you would see in a stochastic time series if you were to numerically integrate that stochastic equation of motion for a single mode. So when the time delay is small, then you won't see much difference between time delay or no delay. And the reason for that, actually, there is, a, there is, a, there is an uh, intermediate threshold as well. It turns out that when you have this condition satisfied, lambda tau less than 1 over e, then the imaginary part of the eigenvalue, which has the, which has the smallest absolute value, is actually zero. So you will have non-oscillatory relaxation, which are the dominating one. Once you, once you pass that, you will see oscillatory features in the time series. These are the oscillatory features which, which uh, to some extent, govern the Hutchinson models, those uh, periodic limit cycles. So it's the same reason that if lambda tau less than the threshold but greater than some other value, you have basically these periodic features, oscillatory features. And if you do exceed the threshold, then the amplitude of this stochastic variable is going to diverge exponentially. So it's going to have the oscillatory feature, but the real part of the, of the rates, of, uh, which is the solution of the characteristic equation, is going to be positive. So you're going to have exponentially exploding uh, oscillatory divergence. So when t goes to infinity, the, the variance of this quantity would go to infinity. 
okay, this is the, the actual spread or variance, again, for a single mode, just to keep in mind a single equation for whatever lambda is, this is the threshold. So when the lambda tau product is less than pi over 2, then this quantity will saturate. This is when you reach that, uh, stoch uh, that, that steady state in a stochastical sense. You, you have a finite uh, variance, finite width if, you're, you, if, if you were to consider all modes. Once the, for any mode, if the product lambda tau is greater than pi over 2, then you're going to have exponential divergence. But you may see these, uh, these remnants of periodic oscillations as well. So again, that is because all these features which enter into this behavior is coming from the solution of the characteristic equation. And that equation is extremely rich. So it will have solutions which will have negative real parts, positive real parts if you, if you pass the threshold. It may have imaginary parts as well. So you will have these uh, oscillatory uh, signatures as well. OK, so uh, before moving on to the network, maybe one more thing about the individual, the individual modes. For this particular case, again, as I mentioned, these guys did solve that, uh, that uh, stochastic equation of motion, the noise and the delay. And it has a particular form. Other than that, it is worthwhile to know that there is this basic scaling form of the solution. So the variance of an individual stochastic variable with delay can be always written in this fashion, a function which depends on the product of lambda tau. And that's important, because this is a function which will have singularities for small argument and another argument which is related to the, uh, to the, to the threshold. So this is how the, the variance would look like. The bigger the tau, the smaller the synchronizable region. As you keep decreasing tau, you will have a more extended region. So basically, you always, for any non-zero tau, you will have these U-shaped curves in the synchronization and, or coordination, which means that for smaller values of lambda, you have poor coordination. And for larger values of lambda, again, something will happen. That is because you, you exceed this threshold. The function f is such that it will have two singularity, one at 0 and another one at pi over 2. Now, what, sh what you should compare this to, again, this is just the scaling behavior if you, if you see how this works. It, so this is what one should compare this to. As, as I noted, if you look at this, this equation when you have no delay, you know, this is the simplest stochastic differential equation, uh, simple relaxation and Gaussian noise. So what is the steady state variance of, of this variable? It's d over lambda. So the message is that when you have no delay, the way you control the spread is that you make the effective coupling uh, larger. So the larger the coupling lambda, the smaller the, sp the spread is going to be, or the variance. In fact, it is decaying monotonically. So that's the main, the main difference between the system of, of the same sort. Once you throw in a delay here, you go from a monotonic behavior to a non-monotonic U-shaped feature. When you have no delay, you only have one problem. When you have no coupling or, or very weak coupling or, or weak, uh, I will get back there, but basically something associated with weak communications. But the stronger, the, the stronger you try, the better off you are. Once you have time delays, the stronger you try, you may sort of leave the region of efficient operations. So you should not try uh, insanely hard. You should understand what is basically the, 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 the shape of this curve and, and where the trade-offs are. If you keep coupling even stronger, you may reach the region of synchronization or coordination at the other end. OK, so this is sort of the, the, the sketch. Because as I said, in this simple linear coupled system, once you make the decomposition to the modes of the Laplacian, then uh, you know, everything is understood. So now we understand what is the variance for a single variable of that sort. Now we just have to add that up for all the individual modes. So as I said, this is how you can express the, the width for, for the coupled problem. The bigger it is, the poorer the coordination. If you can suppress it or you can minimize it, then you may say that the system is, is, is better coordinated. And it can be expressed in terms of the, the variance of the individual modes. And as it was shown, it can always be written as that, uh, that scaling function, which we now know, which will have a U shape and, uh, and, and a very defined minimum. So the condition is that in order for this to be finite, every mode has to exhibit finite variance, which means that for each mode, this requirement has to hold. So again, it's the same equation. Uh, now for each mode, the eigenvalue times the, the time delay has to be less than some number, which is pi over 2. If that has to hold, it means it has to be valid for the largest one as well. So this is where, for example, for unweighted network, imagine that the CIG is just the, the adjacency matrix. Uh, this is the condition, basically, where the largest eigenvalue of the Laplacian will determine single-handedly whether, whether the time delays are destroying the coordination or not. So you take the time delay, you take the largest eigenvalue of the network. If it is less than this number, then you are fine. If not, then basically you reach this exponential growth phase where the fluctuations diverge exponentially in time. 
Uh, this was noted uh, in, 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 uh, in the context of deterministic consensus problem. And again, the two are inherently related, as, uh, as you can see. So what can you say about the impact of the degree on, on the coordination problem? Um, I was jumping ahead a little bit too much. So, so there are very well-known uh, bounds are known, basically, between the degree of a graph and the eigenvalue of the Laplacian, which plays an important role here. So that is basically less than two times the largest degree and greater than essentially the largest degree. In any case, you can see that the way the largest eigenvalue of the La Laplacian scales is, is, is in the order of the largest degree. So, so graphs with, with even a single node, which has a large degree, will have a very large eigenvalue. So that, that is important because oftentimes, especially in physics, we like to talk about ensemble of graphs when, when you care about the degree distribution and how it looks like. But uh, as far as the synchronization or, or coordination condition goes, really it is, the, it is just a single node with a large degree which can, which can make it or fail it, basically, or destroy the whole, the whole operation of the network if it has too large of a degree. So from this, it follows immediately that if the largest degree is less than you know, pi over uh, 4 tau, then the system is, uh, then it's going to be sufficient for synchronization. If the largest degree is greater than pi over 2 tau, then synchronization breaks down. So you don't have to know what is the degree distribution. You can have a, an arbitrary weird realization, but by chance you happen to have one node which is way too connected. That itself is sufficient to destroy uh, synchronization. So networks with potential large degrees can be vulnerable, and, uh, and again, a single node is sufficient to do that, even if you have no idea what the particular statistics of the distribution of the degrees in general. So what do you do in, in, in ensemble of networks? Uh, in, in physics, we like to, to deal with ensemble of networks. Erdős-Rényi or barabási albert for example. Erdős-Rényi graph is a homogeneous graph. Nodes typically tend to have the same, same degree with exponentially for small fluctuations uh, about the average. In barabási albert networks, you have nodes with large degree, and it's a scale field distribution. So in this case, a meaningful question is that if you generate, let's say, 100 uh, random graphs, what is the fraction of those graphs which will be synchronizable in the, in, the, in the way we define it, namely the largest eigenvalue of that times the time delay is less than pi over 2. So you can keep generating these graphs and then you just measure the fraction of synchronizable networks satisfying this condition. And of course, what you will see is that we do know that, uh, that as you increase n, the eigenvalues in general will increase. So sooner or later, even for a relatively innocent erdős rényi random graph, the largest eigenvalue, which is increasing on typically with n, is going to exceed the threshold. So even for ER type of graphs, if n is sufficiently large, you're going to have a decaying fraction of synchronizable networks. It is even more, more pronounced for barabási albert type scale-free graphs, where the largest degree scales with square root n, hence the largest eigenvalue scales in the same fashion. Once you keep increasing n, sooner or later, the largest eigenvalue is too big, and then the, the system will basically collectively fail. And uh, this is increasing faster than an ER logarithmic increase, so you're going to have a faster, uh, a faster decay in the fraction of synchronizable networks. So again, to, su to summarize this, basically you have uh, the, the main condition goes back to the, eigen, the, the largest eigenvalue of the Laplacian, uh, at least from the viewpoint of the time delay. You can have whatever network you, you are working on. Once, uh, once you have a single node with a large, large degree, that itself may be responsible for the whole destruction of the collective synchronization of the network. And that, of course, is much more pronounced in BA type of networks as, as there the largest degree is, is increasing a square root 10. That's a general feature of, uh, of ensembles of network uh, of this. OK, I'm not sure whether this is uh, useful because of the, the way uh, the, the quality is, uh, is uh, what, what is illustrated here is basically the, the two cases of when, when you have uh, a network synchronization with no delay and the system basically relaxes to a steady state where, where basically the size of the fluctuations uh, reaches a finite value. And these uh, circles indicate basically the, the value of the, of, of the field variable h. And uh, whether it's red or green, it indicates whether it's above or below the mean. And you can see that in this case, the system st st stochastically reaches a steady state when there is a finite width. Of course, there, there, there are noise events, and, but basically you can see that the average width remains uh, a constant. This is the case when, when you are below this threshold. And then you can see that uh, in a, in a, in a well-coordinated fashion, basically, the amplitude of the, of the coordination variables locally is going to exponentially diverge. So 
In this case, it happens to be in a lockstep fashion. So there is, there is synchronization even in, the, in, even in this diverging mode, but in a different way, basically. The amplitude fluctuations are going to diverge in a, in a well-coordinated fashion. Okay, so I have about, how much time do I have left? About 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So, so probably I will, I will just quickly go through some of the cases when you, when you can see how you can exploit, basically, uh, the presence of time delays. Again, as you can see, basically, if you keep increasing the time delay <coughs> beyond some point, that's not good. But the, the fact that, given the time delay, what, what can you do to basically make things uh, more, more optimal, perhaps? So imagine that you start with a network where you have the adjacency matrix AIJ and, and you have some, some control, basically sigma, that will maybe translate it to some uh, general uh, communication freq frequency between nodes. And uh, so basically, you can, you can have a global, a global factor on the rate of communication, the effective coupling strength. So it, it turns out that you can show that the, the, same, the same shape remains. Again, uh, ultimately, whatever the, the spread or the, or the measure of coordination will be goes back to the individual U-shape function. So that was, you had a U-shape function for the individual modes. Now you have to sum it up. You will have just a scale factor in there. You can show again that, this, that uh, as, as you go to larger and larger time delays, then the region of coordination shrinks, but basically you gotta have this U-shaped curve. So as a function of the of the overall coupling, you can you can always try to find some region which is uh, sort of relatively far away from the from the not so f optimal points, namely the small coupling point and the coupling which which results in this singularity as a result of the time delay. You can even show the collapse. Now, how how can you basically? Uh, I'm gonna go here. So how can you exploit it as a trade-off? So again, time delays are given. You may not be able to decrease them, but instead you might be able to do something with, uh, with the actual interaction or the communication. Again, this is a sort of a coarse grained equation where, where this term sort of relates to the fact that how frequently individuals communicate with one another. So imagine that you, you can control the rate of communication. So you can, for, for periods of time, you just don't communicate at all. And then, then again, you start communicating. Again, previously when we solved those equations, we assumed that the rate of communication is basically the same between, between pairs of nodes which are connected. Imagine somehow that you can now control that uh, whether you talk to others or not. So you see you have noise. You always have these uh, stochastic kicks which will, which will uh, sort of increase or de decrease the variable. But you have now a handle on whether you want to exchange information or not. Okay, so ima imagine the following scenario. Let's say that the time delay is such that for the given network, you exceeded the threshold. In which case, you do know that you're going to enter this exponentially increasing uh, uh, function for the, for the spread or the width. So this is the case where you would term the system non-synchronizable. At some point, it's going to start increasing exponentially time. So that's the case when, when you do this type of move, the, the Laplacian relaxation at every single time step. Let's re, uh, refer to that at rate one. So if you do that, you're going to enter that uh, range of exponential increase. So what do you do then, basically? So this is the case where basically trying harder would even, would even make things worse. Instead, what you have to do is to reduce, basically, the rate of, of, of local information exchange. So when, when the time delay is there and you pass the, the instability, you may be better off actually trying to reduce local coordination in order to reach a, a better global performance. And of course, if you don't synchronize at all, that just means you don't have this coupling. So if you synchronize at zero rate, all you have is the, the noise, which is just the, the Wiener process. Even that is better. You have just a power law increase. So basically, once you are beyond the threshold, you have this exponential divergence. That's strongly uh, disadvantageous. The way to, to, to find a trade-off is that you actually try to reduce the communication effort. So if the delays are large, you may be better off reduce your local synchronization rate. And, and that basically essentially coming from that U-shaped curve, basically. Once you are past the right-hand side of the U-shaped curve, you, you better come back, basically, and you can control that with the effective coupling, which can be related to the, to the rate of synchronization. Okay, so a few, a few things that, uh, that I just want to go through. Um, uh, we looked at uh, various kind of uh, uh, weighting schemes, not exhaustively, but just a few examples for, for a number of networks. So one possibility is when you have the same kind of coupling, we may even have different delays. As you can see, you may, you may make these two delays different if you want to, although that's not the most important thing here. Um, and you can do the, the reweighting in two ways. You can do some reweighting in this fashion, 
uh, when you sort of divide the effective coupling by the degree of each node, or you can do it that divided by the average degree. The common feature is that they will all have the same uh, interaction cost. So you sort of want to treat them on the same footing. So again, you can, you can always see these, uh, these U-shaped curves. It turns out that this particular normalization can make uh, different graphs sort of similar. This is sort of what you, this is how you compensate for, for heterogeneous degrees. So in this case, when you do this local normalization, then ER and B type of graphs have an extended region of synchronization and quite close to each other. On the other end, if you do the global, the global coupling, this global weighting, then you have a relatively narrow region of synchronization. And within that, a BA network with this global coupling does typically much poorer. There's a, there is a much narrower region of synchronization. So uh, when you have this type of network, obviously, and this is just a, a global reweighting, it means that heterogeneity is not advantageous. So we have seen that already. If you try to do something locally, you can actually make heterogeneous networks very similar to, to, a, to a homogeneous random graphs, and overall much more efficient than these relatively narrow regions of synchronization. So, so that is something basically that, that we, we, we do see even in the more general cases when we have some kind of weighted coupling, possibly different time delays, not just uh, local, but something which is perhaps due to the transmission time delays and all that. So the basic feature of the U-shaped curves, which, which give right to trade-off and optimization, are there in, in, uh, in, in, in these more general cases. So perhaps this is the, the slide I'm, I'm going to finish with, is that. So, so what is the, the main message here? So again, you can look at a number of systems where, where you have in individual entities, agents, or particles are coupled, and they do exchange some information, perhaps um, in order to make global adjustments, again, like the, the flocking bird problems or like in the, the driver, uh, the, the traffic flow case. Again, basically, you do local adjustments. If you only look in, in, in a limited environment, mathematically, oftentimes, it does translate into some kind of Laplacian, weighted Laplacian or regular Laplacian, short of nonlinearities. We didn't discuss that. So one, you have that. Second, you, you, you typically have a time lag. Time lag because of perhaps information spreading or reaction lag, basically. It takes some time for you to figure out what is the right action. You want to do this, you want to adjust your, your direction of your neighbors, but it takes some time to move your wings or whatever it is, or basically to step on the brakes. So, so all those takes finite time. So time lag is a, is a very common uh, unavoidable ingredient for, for these uh, distributed decision problems. So what happens, and again, I went through this already, but worthwhile to emphasize, when you have no time delays, then the measure of the coordination as a function of uh, connectivity or communication frequency is a monotonically, decaying, monotonically decreasing function, which means that the better the communication, the stronger the, the coupling, the more frequently communicate, the, the better the coordination becomes. So if you measure, the measure of the coordination becomes less and less and less if you, if you increase the quality of communication or, the, or even the, the connectivity of the network. And there is only one problem when there is no connectivity or no communication. This is sort of the low end of the spectrum of the Laplacian. If the, if the smallest non-zero eigenvalue of the La Laplacian is, is very small, then you can have a very poor coordination. So that's sort of at the, at the small eigenvalues of the Laplacian, very well known in these problems. Now, the main difference once you have any kind of finite non-zero time delay is that this monotonic function becomes this uh, non-monotonic, typically some symmetric or asymmetric U-shaped function. And now you have two regions which are, which are strongly disadvantageous for coordination. One is coming, again, from the low end of the, of, the, of the underlying network spectrum. And that is related to low connectivity or no communication. Again, if nodes do not communicate, everyone is just going to do what they want. There will be absolutely no coordination, synchronization, or coherent motion. The other end is basically when, when either the connectivity is too high or just the communication is too much. That is the one which can be basically exploited in the other way around by the trade-off. That if you know that you pass this point, you can come back by reducing communication. So of course the message is that you need to know where you are. Just because the system is non-synchronizable, you may be here or here, but you need to know what the corrective action should be. If you have some idea about the synchronization landscape, then you know that you perhaps have to reduce communication to optimize, optimize the spread and, and make a better coordinated uh, response from the whole system. So with that, basically, I would just put, put up the summary slide again. So we have seen that delays can destroy synchronization and coordination. Uh, in this case, networks with large hubs can be particularly vulnerable. Again, you don't even have to have a, 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 a well-defined degree distribution. You, you can just throw down there an arbitrary graph and just uh, one node have way too many neighbors. That is sufficient to, to totally destroy the global coordination of the whole system. 
Uh, we did see that too much communication can cause more harm than good. If you know where you are on this efficiency curve, you can actually reduce synchronization locally and you can have a better global, global performance at the system level. And along the same lines, we can do optimization and trade-offs basically once we know where we are on this, on, on this U-shaped curve. So I would stop here and, uh, and would happy to answer questions if, if anyone has some. Any questions? Yes, Harish. So, <coughs> do you think these results can be extended to uh, like higher dimensional features on network, like flows on edges, dynamics of flows on edges? I think so. Yes, right. and, yes, and, and and that equals some papers along those lines, and uh, and uh, and I think it can be extended to any system where you have some kind of information data or anything which is exchanged. And actions are triggered basically when that piece of information is received, but perhaps by the time you receive it, the state of the of, of the variable changed at the node where you received it from. So yes. Um. So I was to follow up on the same thing. Are you were really you aware of any uh, any general like, category of networks where uh, you can guarantee that the uh, what you call it? You'll have synchronization in the flows. Yes. Higher dimensions. Yeah, I mean that's that that uh, that, that question is a is, is a project itself. So, so because a, as you can see, a lot a lot depends on to what extent uh, the dynamics that you want to study can be at least approximated initially with the linearized version of the of the model, which oftentimes ends up to be some some version of the Laplacian. If, if that's the case, so if, if the li linearization is acceptable and you end up with some coupling which resembles the, the Laplace, and then, th then you can answer a lot of questions just based on the spectrum. If there is a bunch of nonlinearities which you cannot neglect and, and very important, then, then you, have to, you have to know the details about those nonlinear features. So again, th th then everything becomes model dependent and, and very interesting, but with, with a specific application in mind. Like in a, a lot of, in a lot of models, e even in, in, in simple generalization of epidemic models, sometimes people can introduce uh, incubation periods. So, one way to do that is that you include time delays there. So you can have coupled uh, SIS or SIR models, but with some time delays. And, and again, there, w what happens to the stability of the various outcomes will depend on the time delay. And all that. So, so, the, so you, can, you can only draw this these general conclusion if, if the linearization is sufficiently acceptable. If it is not, then, then, then you have to be very specific to the particular problem that, that you started. Zero thought the dynamics you showed here. Um, so I could see the if they're high degree, then the eigenvalues will be large. Yes. Laplacian. Yeah, yeah. But what about weighted Laplacian? So what is the effect of the weights? Much, much, much weak, much weaker. So basically, there was one. Uh, it, it was in this perhaps the, the simplest one. You can have many, you know. This is one when when we did a weighted Laplacian here. So basically, in this case, this is the adjacency matrix and uh, it is divided by ki. So this is the simplest wei wei weighted Laplacian. That has a limited spectrum, which means that the finite size dependence is going to be much weaker, because even if you increase n, I guess the spectrum is going to be limited between 0 and 2. I, I don't remember that. But, so that itself is, is, is going to cure a lot of things. So then you can compare that, because it has the same cost as something where you have some global weight, but not locally. And, and you can see that if you do that weighted thing, that you can have a much, much better efficiency. So I guess it, it, it is a, it, you know, that, that's just the simplest one which comes to mind. But then you can ask in general that, that imagine that you, you have heterogeneous time delays to begin with. So you have Laplacian coupling, but heterogeneous time delays and arbitrary weights. For a given set of heterogeneous time delays, what would be the best allocation of, of weights? Now, that's, of course, a, a complicated problem, and I have no, not even a clue what the answer is. But, but even for a fixed you know, uniform time delay, what would be the best allocation of weights? We just showed this as, as an example, but you know, by, by, by no way I'm saying that this is the best. So, yeah, a question itself can be that what kind of weighting scheme is optimal for a given set of time delays? And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. This is just one example. It's, it, it doesn't show that it's, it's the best. It shows that it's better when you just... Uh, so this one, the, the weighted local Laplacian is better than, than the globally dividing it by, by the average degree. But, but you know, where the optimum is, I don't know. Yes. Um, the model you show is all based on the continuous time, differential yes, equations. Yes, yes. I was wondering, do we have the like, same nice characteristic when we have the 
this work this great time says not like a well basically situation. the point is it's a very good question because it all because when 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 we do this continuous time thing we really sweep uh, some detail under the rug in that after all when we numerically integrate this it is discrete time to begin with so so what about the discrete time delta t and tau so in, in this regard we make sure that the, the discretization delta t in our scheme is way smaller than tau so so we do not interfere because both of them can can trigger some kind of uh, divergence, right? So that's a basic thing that when you numerically integrate equations, if, if delta t is too large, you're going to have a sort of unstable solution. So we made sure that that's not a problem. But then, then, then along the same line, you can, you can, you can include, uh, basically here there is a finite tau, and instead of the continuous thing, you would have uh, some discrete delta t, right? So basically discrete difference, di uh, di difference delay equation. I think there, the main, the main behavior can be the same, if the discrete time step doesn't interfere with, with the time delay. Once those two become on, on, the, same, on the same order of magnitude, I, I, you, you, so first you have to separate what, what do you think is, 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 the, is, the, is the realistic input. So is the discrete net is, is the nature of the system? If, if yes, you have to figure out what is the time scale of that delta t and how does it compare to tau and, you know, and go from there. So I, I cannot say that, that uh, you will have the same shapes. What I can say is that you will encounter similarly or even more complicated characteristic equations. And as a result of that, you typically have to analyze the solution of those where you have t infinitely many roots. And sometimes you can, you can draw statements from there. Sometimes you have to do it numerically. But, but I don't think that there's a general, general answer what will happen. I can say it, it can be just as complicated, just as complex, and just as interesting. But, but maybe a little bit more work is, is needed to be done there. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Can you turn around this, uh, this problem in the sense where now we, we, we want to use it for design? In other words, can we, for instance, say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, guarantee uh, you know, stability and synchronization and things if I have this type of uh, you know, node degree or what yeah, have you? Excellent. excellent. I, I skipped uh, some slides which was done by others anyways, a work by others. I wanted to show that, but sort of I was running out of time and didn't want to hang up there. So I'm, I'm going to show it now. So something like this. So basically, in this very simple model, we, we, we did show that uh, the, the measure of coordination can be captured by the sum of each mode, how well coordinated the individual modes are. And we know that the shape of this function, this quality function, is this U-shaped curve. And what enters the argument is the, is the Laplace and eigenvalues. So sort of. Naturally, what you, you would want, and again, this is going to be a silly example, you would want a network which, uh, which uh, has a very well-focused or narrow eigenvalue spectrum in an ideal world, and, and then you could perhaps tune with a global, with a global prefactor that where the spectrum should be. So you don't want this because this is the low communication region, and you don't want this because this is the time delay instability. You want something like this, so that each mode, the eigenvalue of each mode falls at the minimum of this U-shaped curve. So in this simple problem, the linear problem, what we dealt with, you, know, you, you could come up with something like this. The, 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 the silly example would be the complete graph in this case, because you know that there every non-zero eigenvalue is the same, and all you have to do is just multiplying it by a number. So I can create that uh, pathological example, which, which will be the optimum. But usually you don't, it's, it's not uh, beneficial for other reasons, because you cannot uh, you know, establish those links to begin with. So what these guys did, and actually they did it on, a, on, 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 on directed weighted graphs, because there seems to be a, a little bit more, more flexibility what you do is that you can, you can uh, twist and turn a network, sort of you keep the same <coughs> number of nodes, but you throw away links and maybe add more. And as a result of that, you can, you can try to sort of uh, manufacture a graph with a spectrum which is relatively narrow, and then you can sort of slide it. So this paper will have some ideas about that. So that's what they were trying to do, to, to sort of generate the, the Laplacians. So build, not build a network from scratch, but given a network, what you can do to the network. You know, twist and turn, maybe throw away nodes. And as a result of that, you would hope that you would end up with a spectrum which is narrow and uh, localized around the point which is the best for your objective. So, so that's what these guys did, and, and, and that, that would be the answer. I'm, I'm not that familiar what exactly they did, but, but uh, sort of that's what, uh, that's what they outlined, that uh, you can do some optimization by, by doing things to a graph, which will positively benefit the spectrum to achieve the objectives. It, it's a, it's a, it's a bit very complicated, especially once you have directed graphs. You can do a lot of things to your network, weights, directed weights, and, 
and you have a lot of freedom, but, but the complexity also increases, that how to shape the spectrum. And of course, you want to do it with local moves, because you don't want to build it from scratch. But you have a given graph. What you want to do is maybe to knock out a few links to make the whole network behaving better. So yeah, if you want to build a network from scratch, uh, you can build a complete graph and, 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 and uh, just shape, move it wherever you want to. But given a, given a large network of n nodes and you know, large number of links, what are the few links that you have to get rid of to, to, to sort of get rid of the huge instabilities? Th that's an interesting question itself. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker again.